When Fallout RPG came out in 2021, I waited with bated breath for some official adventure to come out or some supplement to accompany a system that I found very intriguing but lacking in some areas. And then I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And eventually I forgot about it over time. And it wasn't until earlier this year that I happened to be looking at Modifius's website where I saw that they had actually started to publish smaller quests in those little pamphlet books or PDFs like they did with Akhtun Cthulhu. And then I saw that there was an actual quest book coming out. I've had time to read it and think about it. So let's dive in. This is a review of Winter of Adam. And here we have our Winter of Adam quest book. Let's take a look at the back cover real quick. Your special, immerse yourself in a whiteout nuclear winter in the Commonwealth Wasteland. Face a fearsome evil sect of Children of Adam, led by the last son of Adam. Meet brand new groups traveling the Commonwealth, from beatnecks and circus big tops to traveling casinos and religious weaponsmiths. Take your characters through a main quest line from level 1 to 17 and beyond. Create characters with new origins for Gen 3 synths, Children of Adam, and Protectrons. And enhance your game with new rules for surviving the harsh winter and gaining reputation with settlements. So, very interesting back cover there. It actually lays it all out there with bullet points instead of big long paragraphs. So... Oh, really do like these inside covers for these uh, Fallout books. Really like that they still keep with the please stand by thing going on there. Um, this was published by Modifius back in 2023. What am I talking about? It still is 2023 with the lead designed by Donathan Fry. So what do we get in this book? Well, we have new player options and tools. We have our three chapters for the actual adventure, and then we have the appendix. And that's pretty much it. So let's take a look at these new player options. In Adam of Winter, players have access to three new character origins. The Generation 3 Siths, finally. Uh, the Protectrons and the Children of Adam. So first up is the Generation 3 Synths. They have your standard robot abilities such as not needing to eat or drink and being immune to poison and radiation damage and diseases. So very OP all off the bat. I really like how difficult it can be to make char charisma tests for not only the Synth character, but your allies as well. That's if the P NPCs you're interacting with know that you are a Synth. Protectrons have a lot of customizability, just like the Mr. Handys from the core rulebook. You have your standard Protectron, the Fire Brigadier, the Medic, Utility, Nucatron, and Protectron X. The Children of Adam are very unique, as they have inherent radiation damage resistance. But not only that, if someone else would take radiation damage, you can straight up take it instead. You can even use stored radiation to make your melee attacks more lethal. Aside from new player options, there are new tables for winter environment conditions and hazards. There's new looting tables, um, some journey complications, and also one of my very favorite additions, the campsite mechanic. So you can actually build campsites here and depending on the materials used can determine what tier uh, campsite that you can make and they each have their different features and advantages and disadvantages and things like that. The main new gimmick in this uh, quest line or whatever is the settlement reputation because settlement reputations are going to play a major role in this adventure and you'll often have to use them in tests. I'll just say this, there are many ways to lower your group's reputation within a settlement so you'll want to start buttering up the citizens early and often. And you mainly do this by through decision making during quests. Like how your quest ends and things like that. And so with that being knocked out of the way, let's take a look at the very first act. Welcome to the Commonwealth. This is by far the longest chapter in the entire book. 
It serves as a setup for what will happen in Act 2 and ultimately in Act 3. You'll travel around to the different locations and build relationships with other settlements by doing side quests for them. The main quests, aside from the first one, can be pushed forward at any time. This is a very sandbox heavy adventure, with the book presenting what the main quests are and suggestions on when to initiate them and the different locations and what side quests you can uncover within each of those. The first main quest is the train job. This serves as an introduction to the game, while setting up a viable way to gain entrance to Diamond City. So the PCs come to Diamond City to gain shelter from the brutal winter along with a long line of others, and they spot a wandering caravan guard begging for help. The PCs rush in to help the guard by helping them through the routed crowd and are granted an audience with Mayor McDonough. Their task to find out what happened to the raided caravan. Overall, this is a great setup for an introductory quest, but it assumes many things of the players, and if they don't take the bait, then everything afterwards kind of seems very awkward. And they do provide some contingencies for if the players don't jump in to save the caravan guard. So uh, there is that, but it's still really awkward. After dispatching the raiders who attack the caravan at their bunker, the PCs are given shelter in Diamond City and even a place to stay. Something to note, at the end of each quest, you'll see the possible fallouts for the player's actions. I like this because it keeps things centered and moving forward. And it also gives you some, you know, possibilities like if they did this and they didn't kill this person, then this is what happens in the world. So really good that they added that especially for this being a very sandbox heavy game the second main quest becomes available after the pcs have completed at least four commonwealth settlement side quests and we'll get to those after we go over the main quests in cleansing fire the pcs are tasked with securing a new supply route in the sewers beneath boston but lurking in the sewers is a sect of the children of adam the pcs can of course resolve this through peace or not. Each have their own ramifications, as you'll see in the Fallout. This is the one of the only quests to actually have a map, which is something I would have loved to see more of. And because there's a map, you also get descriptions of each of the rooms and the tasks that you can complete within each room and things like that. And of course you're going to find your stats for your NPCs within this table because, as, again, you can Go through this peacefully or not. The third main quest, A New Eden, becomes available after the PCs have completed most of the side quests in this act. The PCs are tasked with investigating a now beached ship, the USS Germination, to find food to distribute to the other settlements. The food on the ship, however, is genetically engineered and not only that, it turns anyone who eats it into a berserking cannibal. This is my favorite quest in the entire book because of how different it is and how raised the stakes are for the PCs. Because the PCs could very well eat this flesh fruit, now setting up a clock before the inevitable happens. This is also where the last Sons of Adam's followers really start to make their presence known in the Commonwealth. The last son of Adam is the leader of the sect of the Children of Adam with radicalized ideas, and we'll see more of him later. But he basically sends his force to take over the USS Germination to get this flesh fruit, as well as the cure for it, because he who controls the food during the winter controls everything. In order to gain access to the second and third main quests in this act, players will need to complete side quests, and each settlement has a side quest a tie to it. So Diamond City has Digging In, which tasks PCs with helping quell tensions between the Minutemen and the Children of Adam, which each have rooms at the Dugout Inn. In addition, players can get the side quest, We Got the Beat, which has PCs taking a ghoul trader to Beatsville, which is a hidden settlement home to brilliant artists, but little to no protection. This serves as a great introduction to that specific settlement. Good Neighbor has a very good neighbor, which has Hancock asking the PCs for help in securing supplies meant for Diamond City for his own people. Yep, that pretty much sounds like something Hancock would do. Mirage has Midnight at the Oasis, 
which has the PCs help a blackjack player enter a high-stakes game that's been rigged against him from the very start. Big Top has the Illustrated Man, which has the PCs help a Protectron secure a bunker, but this is a trap used to lure and eliminate the PCs. Um, by far, this is probably one of the weaker side quests, just because, yeah, it's just go here and then beat the bad guy at the end. But there is a radioid freak there as well, waiting for them, that's been trapped in this bunker as well. Beatsville has Beat It, which tasks the PCs with help helping keep Beatsville a secret from pilgrims who are scavenging a little too close to the hidden town. And then we have Mechminster Abbey. Mechminster Abbey has Forged in the Dark, which tasks PCs with securing a special part needed to build an anti-radiation cannon. Yeah, that's probably coming back later down the line. And this is used in order to take out a Frost Feral Ghoul Horde, which is every bit as frightening as it should sound. So far, we have a setup. We have settlements with needs and, and, and PCs to help them, but so far, there really hasn't been a major threat. Aside from the brutal winter. Enter Act 2. We now know how this adventure is set up. You go around and complete side quests to unlock the next main quest. On the surface, this seems very basic and almost linear. But there is an actual reason for it. You see, this is the act where the stakes become known. The commonwealth, and therefore the settlements, are under attack. Entire settlements can be utterly decimated. Who or what has the power to do such a thing? The Gigapede. The Gigapede is a ginormous mutated bug that the last son of Adam has trained. And you can actually uncover how they've trained this Gigapede and how to counteract this training. It, basically, they use sign language to do so. And one of the characters, that one of the NPCs that the PCs can potentially meet uh, I think in Beatsville, is deaf, and she communicates through sign language, um, which she learned through books. And so the PCs could actually um, get training in sign language so they can, so they can uh, be familiar with some of the signs, which they can see uh, some of the raiders or some of the last sons of Adam's forces using to uh, direct the Gigapede. So the act begins with one of the settlements chosen by the GM being attacked by the Gigapede. And what follows are various side quests to prepare for the next attack and then the next. The book does give some suggestions as to how to choose which settlements get the brunt of the Gigapede's attacks. But I find it very confusing that it goes out of its way to say that the GM should not use Diamond City in these attacks. As the city is too big for the Gigapede to effectively attack. And then there's an explanation on how the Gigapede would attack Diamond City. I might have missed something there, but... I guess I am kind of glad that they did that just in case the GM wanted to raise the stakes even higher and do the thing that the book says you shouldn't do. If the PCs have been diligent in keeping their reputation with the various settlements up, then they can enlist some much needed aid. Remember that anti-radiation cannon from McMister Abbey? If they met a certain NPC on their journey, they can even tame the Gigapede and use it against the last son of Adam's forces. That's the deaf character I was talking about before. But what if the PCs don't save the day? Then there's a contingency plan. The Gigapede does eventually go down, but at the cost of some NPCs and some settlements will be destroyed. I like the events that take place in this act. I like that it provides some much needed tension. However, I don't like where it takes place in this adventure. It seems too big of a concept for act two, especially given what happens in act three, and when it's all said and done, this seems to contained, almost like an isolated event. Sure, we got to know the settlements and its leaders in Act 1, but Act 3 kind of throws most of that out the window. Speaking of which, let's get into it. The Day of the Vision. We met all the settlements and their leaders, went on a ton of side quests, and defeated a big, bad Gigapede. Where do we go from here? The answer is, we take the fight to the last son of Adam. For me, this is where the campaign kind of goes downhill. We know the forces of the last son of Adam have been up to something, and we think that their ultimate goal was to unleash the Gigapede of the Commonwealth. 
The PCs are set upon this by a random NPC that comes seeking them, pointing them to the Watley Research Facility where the last son of Adam is holed up. The first main quest points the PCs to navigating the Glowing Sea, which of course has its own complications since the entire area is irradiated. Once they get there, however, they are beset by an enormous glowing one who has ties to an NPC that they'll meet later. Eventually, the PCs do make it to the crater of Adam, and there are new NPCs to meet, and they also have their own side quests. But honestly, they don't really matter. Well, okay, one really matters. We already know what the end game is here, so why not just point us in the right direction? And the one NPC that does matter, you would not really think that you would gain anything from it, but you actually get an item that basically makes the final boss beatable or easier so there is that so then the pcs eventually get to the last main quest which is buried city and this is the final main quest of the campaign the goal is to make it to the watley research facility learn some lore which points to the last son of adam as being a descendant of the facility's creator or owner or something like that um, you go through the facility, and unfortunately, there is no map. So this really feels like a linear area, which is a shame. And at the end of the tunnel, however, is an elevator, which takes the PCs down into the depths beneath the facility. And this is where things get really strange. I will say this. I have never thought that the campaign's finale would take it in such a bizarre direction. So the PCs start having visions and can be taken under the influence of the last son of Adam. Yep, that's right. The campaign can end right here and right now. The last son of Adam gives the PCs a choice, either give into these visions of a perfect future or face annihilation. But before we get into that, let's try to understand who the last son of Adam is. Who is he? What are his motives? And what makes him special? The last son of Adam's real name is Adam Watley who is a descendant of General John Watley, who followed a false god. Years ago, Adam met a man who taught him about Adams and the church, and he had a dream where he found a forgotten city beneath the earth covered in Adam's glow. Adam, that's the person, however, is dying from chem use and exposure to radiation. Who would have thought? Most likely from a crystalline device he has strapped to his chest, which protects him with Adam's glow. He eventually found the Forgotten City and buried within an obelisk with a tentacled abomination. That's right, we're going full of crafty in here. His goal is to use Adam's glow to purify the land and lead the faithful to a world without evil, or something such other. Anyways, it's time to fight. The last son of Adam has power armor, but not only that, he is protected by a unique energy field provided by the crystalline device. And not only that, PCs will have to contend with the buried abomination with the tentacles. So in one of the previous side quests, uh, the PCs might have come across a chem suppressant syringe. In order to use this, the PCs need to bring a piece of Adam's armor down to zero HP and manage to hit him with the syringe. Of course, you don't need to take the easy way out. You can always just blast him until all of his armor is done and reduced to zero HP. And that's pretty much it the the whole set the whole campaign ends with the uh, PCs going back up the elevator and reflecting on what they have just done. It should come as no surprise if you've been listening to this review that I am not a big fan of the third act. I'm still on the fence about the entire campaign. It just it doesn't really seem like the epic fallout campaign that I wanted. But then again, I don't think this quest line is trying to be. This seems more like a very large side quest or DLC perhaps, if you've ever played the uh, Fallout 3 or Fallout 4, which kind of irks me a little bit because the campaign takes you from level 1 to level 17. And I'm not really sure like what the level cap is in this system, even after some research. So it could be level 30 for all I know, and maybe this only takes you through ha like about half of what your PCs can go through. I don't know. Also, I find the order of events to be really awkward. 
I, I, I find that the Act 2 has more stakes involved for the PCs and the Commonwealth as opposed to Act 3, which is just the PCs going to the place to beat the bad guy. Speaking of the third act, it really comes out of nowhere. Here's how I would fix it if I was going to run this for my group. First, I'd keep Act 1 the same. This is important in setting the characters and the settlements and gaining some reputation between uh, the PCs and everybody in the region. I would switch Act 2 and Act 3. The PCs know about The Last Son of Adam and some sort of attack is being planned. So the PCs are taxed with seeking out the last son of Adam's forces to see what they are up against. They can find the Watley Research Center facility, the Watley Research Facility, but this should only be to discover the Gigapede. But they are too late. The Gigapede has been unleashed and the PCs have to rush back to the various settlements to warn them of the impending attack. In fact, they're probably going to be too late for one or two of the settlement's attacks. Then Act 2, which is now Act 3, happens, and just as it should. You could keep the weird Lovecraftian theme going on there with the third act, if you want. I find that to be the part that really kind of hit me the hardest, because it just... Not that it doesn't fit the Fallout universe, it just really comes out of nowhere, without really anything going to warn you about it. It's just there for the sake of being there. Like if that was the focus of the campaign, then yeah, I could see it happening. Now, I normally don't point this out, but this book has a ton of typos and some of the references within are just plain wrong or just not there. Like there's a space for it, but they're just not there. So uh, I'm not really sure what I was expecting from the first quest book in the Fallout RPG. Perhaps I wanted an epic campaign, just like in the Fallout games. That would be nice, but I actually had to remind myself when I was reading this book that there is a big difference between video games and then tabletop RPGs. I think most of the problems that I have with the campaign would have been rectified if the scope was brought down just a little bit. like. Not an entire campaign that takes you from level 1 to 17, but maybe within 5 levels. So that it feels more like an actual DLC or a side, an epic side quest. And then I can keep my campaign going afterwards and still keep it interesting for my players. So that now they're not just big super badasses roaming the wasteland from this one campaign. I also think that if The Last Son of Adam had more, had been more involved with the plot from the very beginning, like actual made a presence to the PCs from Act 2 onwards, it would have been, it would have made him more of a viable villain instead of a whisper upon the wind. Also, setting up the Lovecraftian elements beforehand would have also been better. So it could have been like a giant kaiju thing that attacks the Commonwealth instead of a giant gigapede. I would have been fantastic and helped the PCs prepare for their eventual encounter with uh, Adam Watley and his tentacled obelisk and other weird machinations that go down in that cavern. So would I recommend this? Of course I would. If you are a fan of Fallout or want something to play, then I would wholly recommend you adapt this for your gaming table. But this works best as a standalone, meaning don't bring any characters that you already have established that maybe are like level 7 or something like that into the beginning of this. Although you could do that by bumping up the difficulty, I guess, but this works better as a standalone. And there is a lot of content in here, of, and of course, more than enough room to expand the material and actually flesh out you know, some characters like The Last Son of Adam and such. So that is it for this video. Feel free to leave a comment down below. Give this video a huge thumbs up to support this series, and I will see you guys in the next video.